Greenhorns in Manhattan. The honeymoon consisted of one night at a Kansas City hotel as we tried to consummate our vows without the benefit of Masters and Johnson or Henry Miller. Brand new as we were to the game, our expectations were no doubt unrealistic, steeped in the hyperboles of the romantic poets. Despite our earnest efforts, the planets proceeded placidly in their orbits, nor did Eileen's cervical cap or my latex shield installed in the nick of time do anything to heighten our prosaic pleasure. No time for regrets. Early the next morning, a cab whisked us away to a windblown station where we boarded a train to Cambridge in the Naval Communications School on the Harvard campus. My father-in-law had shrewdly reserved a private compartment and we did our best to make up for the night before. Apparently radio technology wasn't the only skill I would be learning in the next few months. It would take a lot longer than that if the Navy authorities had their way. On weeknights I was restricted to my dorm room. Half the time was spent lying in bed repeating to myself that this unholy torture would someday come to an end. When I tried to win over Lieutenant Henry, my superior officer, by pointing out that I'd been married for only a few days, he told me to shape up. Some of our men have been separated from their wives for months, even years. You young whippersnappers don't know the first thing about suffering. Be grateful for what you've got and have a little heart. And somehow I couldn't see it his way. My urges were too great and my bride was staying only a couple of blocks away. What more devastating persecution could the military mete out? One Tuesday night, I decided I'd had enough. Aware that there were occasional bed checks, I convinced myself fate couldn't be cruel enough to arrange one on this particular occasion. And what could they do to me anyway? Court-martial me for such a minor offense, especially when my predicament was all too human? Unfortunately, my apprehensions got the better of me and I saw a flicker of disappointment on Eileen's face afterwards, but that was only the beginning. When I snuck back into my room early the next morning, I found a piece of paper pinned fastidiously to my pillowcase. Report to Sergeant M at once. He greeted me with a stern look. Ensign Schubert, where were you last night? In the arms of my beloved, I blurted out. Don't be a smart-ass, Schubert. I can send you to the brig so fast you'll think a hurricane hit you. His beady brown eyes bored a hole in my conscience. But I... No buts, young fellow. You're an officer and you'd better start acting like one. A little courage is what you need. Listen closely now because I'm going to explain your punishment just once. From 18 o'clock to 24 o'clock on Saturday and Sunday... You will sign in at the commander's office every hour on the hour. Do you have any questions? For your sake, I sincerely hope not. One more wisecrack from me and my fate was sealed. Yes, sir. I mean, no, sir. I mustered a hasty salute. Dismissed, Ensign, were the last words I heard as I slunk out of his office. Eileen and I spent the next three Sundays exploring the countryside and taking in the multitude of historic sites around Boston. One day we rented a bright yellow tandem bicycle and headed off for parts unknown, stopping only when the fancy struck us. Before we knew it, we were on the road to Lexington and Concord, not realizing that we would be riding uphill and down dale, unfortunately mostly up. Halfway through the 25-mile journey, I would have gladly traded our two-headed beast for Paul Revere's horse. Paul's bottom could not have been any sore than ours. Another weekend, we lounged by a poppy field along the Charles River, sharing a picnic lunch and stealing a kiss or two whenever the coast was clear. Although the Japanese had absorbed enormous losses, the war was dragging on. We listened to the radio night and day, waiting anxiously for an announcement that they had surrendered. Meanwhile, the Navy had no idea what to do with me. Its ranks were overflowing with ensigns, all of whom seemed to be redundant at this point. I was sent back to Great Lakes for further orders. With a week on our hands before I was scheduled to report, we decided to play the part of the naive Greenhorns and explore Manhattan. We took the train down from Boston and checked into the Commodore Hotel, carrying all our possessions in two overnight cases. 
strolling past the fully stocked shops on Fifth Avenue, we asked ourselves whether a war was really going on after all. The rich and famous didn't seem to be wanting. Servicemen of all stripes crowded the area. In the space of a block, I was called upon to salute at least 20 times. Many of these men had been serving for four years or longer and would soon be home marrying their fiancés and looking for work. But I was a rank newcomer. I couldn't expect release to inactive duty for at least another year. I had already made plans for graduate school and was eager to start earning money so we could settle down and raise a family. Being an only child, Eileen wanted six offspring, but I would have been happy with two. During the next three days, we must have hit every point of interest the city had to offer. On our last night, we splurged and went to see Oklahoma, Rogers and Hammerstein's first smash hit. Afterwards, we popped into an ice cream parlor and shamelessly slurped down a couple of hot fudge sundaes. Not yet ready for bed, we strolled towards Greenwich Village, soon finding ourselves in front of a neon sign flashing the words, Cafe Society Downtown. A homeless man with a little terrier was perched on an orange crate by the entrance. I tossed a dollar bill into his hat full of coins. Inside the small club, we were directed to a bench along the mirrored wall. There was no cover charge, but a two drink minimum at a dollar apiece. We soaked in the Glenn Miller and Tommy Dorsey tunes and watched the other guests slowly make their way around the dance floor. How about it, honey? Sure, why not? I'm not the best dancer in the world, but something about the ambience that night swept away my usual inhibitions. Eileen gave me an appreciative look, and it was a good half hour before we plopped back down on the bench. Exhausted, but with my senses quickened, I couldn't help but overhear a nearby conversation. A balding, middle-aged man was talking feverishly to a woman in her mid-twenties, apparently his secretary. His wife was out of town for the weekend, and he was determined to make the most of it. His companion appeared reluctant at first, but I sensed her resistance crumbling with each sip of her drink. A short time later, they left arm in arm. When I looked around, a striking young woman was walking through the front door, flanked by a couple of equally attractive men. I poked Eileen in the side. Do you know who that is? No idea. That's Judy Garland. You're putting me on. What would she be doing in a place like this? It's her, all right. Judy was an all-time favorite of ours. Just a few months earlier, we had seen her perform for an enthusiastic audience at Orchestra Hall. They couldn't get enough of her, and we lost count of the encores. I'm going over to talk to her, I said. Get some brains for once, will you? She wouldn't give the time of day to a nobody like you. I grabbed Eileen's hand and dragged her over to where our idol was sitting. Ignoring the goons, I walked straight up to her and said, You're Judy Garland, right? She didn't even turn her head. My wife and I are here on our honeymoon, I continued brazenly, hardly aware of my words. We saw you in Chicago last year. We have all your records. Could we bother you for an autograph? This time she looked up and smiled. Sure, kid. Got a pencil and paper? Gee, no. Fortunately, one of her companions came to the rescue. Have you seen The Wizard of Oz? She asked as she signed the napkin. Sure, five times. It's playing at Radio City. If you'd like to make it six, take this autograph to the box office. They'll let you in for free. Good luck and have a great stay in New York. It was two o'clock by the time the taxi dropped us off in front of the hotel. Back in our room, Eileen collapsed into bed and fell asleep right away. Lying awake with my arm around her, I relived the events of the past two months. As I was drifting off, a gust of wind shook the window pane and a voice whispered in my ear, There's no place like...